the preparing to live stream on YouTube is taking a lot more time. Well, mine's I it's something came up that said webinar is now streaming live on YouTube. Okay, I'm going to start the broadcast and we will start the meeting there, Mr. Gazar. Sounds good. Uh, Mr. Nepp, do we have uh, CNET in here as well? Yes, they are logged in. I'm here. I'm okay. Ready. Okay. With that, then we'll call the meeting to order. And uh, Mr. Nepp, I don't know if you have a flag for us to look at. No, I do not. Okay. Well, we'll just uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance then. Uh, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, the United States, States of, America, of America, America and to the Republic, and to the Republic for, for which it stands. stands. One nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Um, with that, um, let's see here. We'll do a roll call, please. Dr. Badger. Here. Mrs. Bruckner. Here. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Here. Mr. Gazar. Here. Mr. Kroll. Here. Mr. Musser. Present. Ms. Smith. Here. Mr. Steiner. Here. Mrs. Weaver. Here. Thank you. Move down to 104. <clears throat> so we'll just uh, make the statement that as approved at the March 24, 2020 board meeting, the board will be continuing with the temporary suspension of portions of policy 006.1, including but not limited to, limited to reasons for electronic suspension, I'm sorry, reasons for electronic participation, the number of board members who can participate electronically, and the manner in which electronic participation is requested, that that be temporarily suspended to the extent necessary to conduct needed board business. And with that, we'll move to uh, approval of the agenda. So it is recommended that the agenda for the April 7, 2020 board meeting be approved as presented. Steiner, so moved. I just second. Thank you, Mr. Steiner and Dr. Badger. Uh, do we have any uh, additions, comments, concerns? Dr. Saylor, I believe you mentioned you wanted to um, to try to add something there that we missed. Okay, um, well, no comment. Then. No comment Go there, ahead. no. We're good. Okay. Uh, hearing none, then we'll, uh, it's moved and seconded. So roll call on the agenda, please. Mrs. Bruckner. Yes. Mrs. Fitzgerald. Yes. Mr. Gazar. Yes. Mr. Crowell. Yes. Mr. Musser. Yes. Ms. Smith. Yes. Mr. Steiner. Yes. Mrs. Weaver. Yes. Dr. Badger. Yes. Thank you. Uh, looking at you there, Rick, if you have a screen for the public participation. Hearing somebody's background noise there. Well, so this is a, a public comment. And uh, if there are anyone watching either on CNET or YouTube or uh, registered as a uh, guest for this evening's meeting, now's the time to um, uh, press the raise hand and be acknowledged for public comment. Do we have any public comment this evening?
Okay, well, we did receive a couple emails, so I will read this one. This is uh, first one is from Stacy Burns. Uh, it says, good evening. A question I have for the board tonight is regarding band instruments. Is it possible for students who had left their instruments at the school to access them during the shutdown period? In relation to that, with the instruments that are currently at home, would they need to go through a deep cleaning before they return to school? And if so, could you elaborate on that process? During the deep cleaning, were lockers opened and the contents disinfected, food removed, et cetera? There may be some interesting science experiments upon return. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. And let me see, I think I have two others. Uh, while I'm looking those up, um, Dr. Saylor, would you like to comment on that one at all? No, um, Mr. Bartow would be able to give um, uh, the details on the deep cleaning process. I don't know if he's here tonight. If he's not here tonight, he can report on that or respond to that at uh, a later time after this evening. As far as um, any students coming into the school for anything at this time, that that is a no. If there is something that is necessary, as we had done in the past, the parents can reach out to the school principal who then would schedule um, an arrangement to get whatever is needed from the from the school um, to the family. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Barto, are you with us to answer that at all? Um, <clears throat> yeah, as far as the, uh, the, the, I guess the question was, they wanted to know for bringing instruments in what the process would be for a deep clean. Um, I know what we use to deep clean the buildings, but I don't know what would be used specifically for, for an instrument. I guess that would um, rely on someone else with a little bit more expertise in, in the use of the instruments, but everything that we did was, was cleaned and disinfected with the proper EPA approved disinfectant. Okay, thank you. And with that, I'll read the next one here which is um, from Ms. Delostrito. Uh, other districts in our area have appeared to have found ways to continue covering this year's curriculum under an encouraged but not required non-graded model using Google Classroom, Zoom, and hard copy packets distributed by mail for families without internet access. I understand Belfont is not taking this approach. Why not? And what is Belfont's plan to cover the remaining material for the year. Uh, with that one, I'll say, excuse me, um, stand by for our report section. I think most of those questions will be uh, discussed and hopefully addressed. And thank you for that comment. And I believe there was a third here. Let me find it. Uh, that's all I see now is those two. Uh, Mr. Nepp, if you had any others, uh, uh, if you can send them my way, if they come in, that would be great. Those were the only two I was aware of. Okay. So with that, we'll move to uh, item 301. It is recommended that the minutes from the regular meeting of March 24, 2020 be approved. Do I have a motion for that? Bruckner, so moved. Gerald, second. Thank you. And uh, with that, we'll do a roll call, please. Mrs. Fitzgerald? Yes. Mr. Gazar? Yes. Mr. Carl? Yes. Mr. Musser? Yes, and I want to say that I might have to leave the meeting. I might have an emergency. Understood. Thank you. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Steiner? Yes. Mrs. Weaver? Yes. Dr. Badger? Yes. Mrs. Bruckner? Yes. And may I ask who seconded that, please? Uh, Fitzgerald. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I apologize. I didn't ask if there was a discussion on that item. Did anybody have any recommendations or changes to that before we voted on it? OK, hearing none, we'll leave that as is and move to item 401 budget discussion with Mr. Bean. John, can I quickly give the capital campaign? Cause I might have to leave. Uh, 
I, it'll be very, very brief. Necessary, but if you would like to. Okay. So all we've done is we've gone ahead and uh, I, I sent an email out saying, given the economy, physical distancing, and unknown length of the pandemic, I see no option but to suspend our activities for an unspecified length of time, and everybody agreed. So that's where we are at this point. I am going to leave the meeting. Hopefully, I'll be back soon. Okay, thank you, and good luck, Rod. Okay, uh, Mr. Bean, with a budget discussion, please. Yes. Budget discussion is coming up on the board docs, hopefully. Uh, while I'm waiting for that, the state is currently looking, and I'm not sure if Mrs. Smith will go over this uh, more detail later, but the state is currently looking at freezing property taxes for next year, this coming year, which is always a good thing if you can freeze taxes, but that's going to significantly impact the school district. Now, obviously be staying on top of this one to see what happens, but there's a lot of unknowns going into this coming year with uh, real estate taxes, assessed value on those taxes, uh, earned income tax and so forth. So uh, we have a lot of unknowns and if the state throws that one in, it'll really be a, a, a big unknown on what we're going to do going forward. So I just want everybody to be aware that that could come up. Tonight we'll go over the revenues and uh, uh, in a summary form. Uh, as I said, it's difficult to get numbers right now. I called the assessment office, they're not open and I couldn't leave a message. So I don't even have a, a current snapshot of where we're at. But right now our budget is like it's been in past years, about 65% of our total revenues are coming from our local places or 33,700,000 plus. That's real estate taxes, earned income taxes, and so forth. The state's about 34%, almost $17.5 million. That's our basic ed and special ed subsidies, primarily transportation, social security, and retirement subsidies. And then we get just shy of a half a million dollars from the federal, uh, and that's primarily Title I and Title II. Now that's 65% of our total revenue uh, which is local revenue, that's made up of basically your real estate tax, which is the overwhelming majority of that at 75% and another 19% of earned income tax. Uh, the earned income tax, if you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll hit the earned income tax. Real estate taxes, if you look at this, this is the past 10 years. Uh, in the first three columns after the year, you'll see the assessed valuation and that's what gets added to the tax rolls. Uh, it's been a, a high of 2.59 uh, last year. Uh, current year, we're at about 1.5%. I'm budgeting 1% right now. I don't know if we're gonna make that or not. I, like I said, I can't see the current snapshot to see where we're even at right now. A lot gets added in the spring. Typically, that probably won't be happening or at least as much. So we're gonna have to look at this number but right now I'm just budgeting a 1%, which is less than it's been the last three years. Uh, if you see the 2015, 16, 17, it was below 1% those three years. But the last three, it's been above uh, uh, 1.5, almost 1.5 this past year and a high in 2019 to 2.6. So we're hoping uh, that uh, we still have some significant uh, additions that have been going on. It was a mild winter. So hopefully construction continued uh, throughout the winter uh, and we had some things added before all this happened. Now the earned income tax. Uh, just for people that are listening at home or might watch this later on, earned income tax, that's the tax they withhold from your paycheck. Uh, for Belfont, it's 1.2%. 0.5% of that rate goes to the school district. The other half a percent, if you live in one of the townships or if you live in a borough, it's 0.6%. So your tax rate's either 155 or 1.65. Uh, again, 1.05 of that goes to the school district. And again, this is based on where you live, not where you work. And, and it's now collected by the center uh, tax collection committee is in charge of it and it's uh, collected by center tax agency. Mm -hmm. 
state revenues. Uh, as we said, that was about 34% of the total. That 34% is broken up by the basic education subsidy is almost half of that. Special ed subsidy is only 10% of that total number. And with the retirement rate climbing so high in the mid 30s percents now, the retirement subsidy, which we get half of that back from the state is up to 20%. So the retirement subsidy is double what our special education subsidy is right now. And you can see some of the other, uh, social security 4%, transportation 4%, uh, ready to learn block grant 2% and so forth. Here's just a simple bar graph of our basic ed subsidy. These numbers I have include the ready to learn grant because some years, depending on the governor, what they've done, they've included it with basic ed. Some years they break it out. It, it just depends on the governor. So to really to have an apples to apples, I combine them both together to show this. But you can see it's climbed from uh, 2012, just shy of 8 million to we're a little bit over 9 million. That's a million dollars, but that's over 10 years. So considering what our costs go up just based on some items we'll talk about in a, in a few slides from now, that's really not a ton of money to cover our increasing mandated costs that the district really has little uh, say or control over. Oh, back one, please. Back one. One slide, please. I'm working on it, Ken. Okay. All that was was the federal revenues, uh, and they are a very small percent. The biggest chunk of that is our Title I. We have uh, one Title I school, I believe now, just Belfont Elementary. Just leave it right there. That's fine. Okay. 82% is uh, Title I. The other 18% is uh, Title II. Thank you. Now, uh, with Act 1, we have an adjusted index of 3.3%. Assuming our assessed value is the same, that 3.3% on the existing uh, assessed value gives us roughly $850,000 more of real estate tax income. But just from salaries and benefits, we have a $645,000 increase. 300,000 of that are the four new positions I mentioned uh, last meeting. Those are two elementary teachers at Marion Walker, and well, one at Marion Walker, one at Belfont Elementary for uh, projected class sizes. One uh, phys ed teacher, which is uh, something that we were able to reduce last year, but we have to pick up this year for continuity of the, uh, the program running through the elementary schools. And we also have uh, an additional social worker. We have one contracted, but we're budgeting for an additional one as an employee this coming year. Charter school tuition, we are budgeting $3 million this coming year. Right now, again, uh, we're, we're frozen, but uh, I'm hoping 3 million is enough and that we don't get a, a large influx of uh, charter school uh, students. But we're budgeting three million. That's up two hundred fifty thousand from the two million seven fifty. That right now, I'm guessing that's where we're going to come in at. CPI tuition, their their uh, budget isn't finalized yet. But the last number I got from them, it was an increase of one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Other tuition, this is uh, increasing one hundred eighty five thousand, primarily for special education programs uh, at other districts or in other districts that uh, the our students, so we have to pay for it. And the bond payments just from amortization schedules, that's going up $175,000 for this coming budget. All that totals $535,000 more than that $850,000 we're getting. Now, <clears throat> that's what we're short right now. The other ups in, in a couple of the subsidies or offset by a couple increases in other areas, but these are the primary uh, cost drivers, if you would, uh, for the school district. And that's where we're short the $535,000 right now. Uh, the next meeting, we'll have another budget discussion. We have started the food service and athletic fund uh, budgets. Uh, we've had, uh, I've had a couple of meetings on those with uh, uh, both the athletic director and the food service director on those. We will be voting to adopt the proposed final budget May 12th. 
review it again May 26th. Right now we are uh, scheduled to approve the or adopt the final budget June 16th. And then June 30th, we would implement the Homestead and Farmstead exclusion. If things are still up in the air, obviously June 16th, we can right now still extend it to June 30th. Uh, I've, I've heard talk of this changing, but I haven't seen anything definite that the state might push this out for us as well. But I don't know that this stage, so I'm not planning for it. But we would have to approve the budget no later than June 30th. Again, that's a summary rather quick uh, based on what we know right now. Uh, we're still obviously working on a lot of numbers. Um, it's very difficult with all the unknowns going on, uh, what the unknowns might be for next year, especially the, the revenue numbers. And uh, if we lose that 850,000 from uh, any kind of proposed real estate increase, uh, we will have to make some very difficult decisions on what we're going to do. Are there any questions? Be happy to answer them. Ken, a couple of questions I had. One is, um, do you account for any um, reduction in earned income for um, the coming year, given the situation we're in, in that model that you have? Uh, in the current model, I haven't reduced it. I never push that number very much. I keep it conservative uh, just because that's one of the numbers that could become volatile. And especially in this regard, so I'm, I'm waiting to see if I can if I can see the next uh, amount of monies that come in, if I can notice any kind of difference or not, uh, to see if that number would be down, or will it just be down for the rest of this year and next year will be okay. I'm not sure, but right now I haven't changed it, but it is not in a very aggressively budgeted number. Okay, and the other two items were uh, the tax collection rate if uh, people are in financial hard, hardships and uh, charter and cyber. I, I see the number you had budgeted. Uh, I missed if you might have mentioned if, if there was an increase from that over last year. Is that based on actual um, notices of, of increases in that or is just something you're budgeting for? In charter school, I, I always budget a little bit of an increase based on where we're at. We're up a few students. Uh, and uh, with the current rates, the way the formula calculates with giving us a little bit of cushion in case we have another student or two add, it's up 250,000. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Ken, I'm sorry. Uh, what, was, what are you budgeting right now for the earned income tax uh, revenue? How much? Yes. Uh, 0.2 million, I believe it is. Okay. I have a question too. Um, when you talked about the new positions um, that would be created, I know that uh, Mrs. Leitzel, when she came and presented before the board, I know there was mention of possibly a um, uh, a new position for Bella. And I was just curious, I didn't hear you mention that um, just now. I wasn't sure if that was still one of the positions that are being that considered. Yes, that was talked about. It, it, it isn't in the budget right now. There's, we talked about maybe a halftime position, a couple of ways I'm, I'm hoping if we need it, I can do it, but it, I don't have it as an additional position right now. Thank you. I'm hoping if we would need that, it would be because of charter schools, students coming over from the charter schools it would be a transfer from the charter school tuition to that position. Okay, any other questions? Thanks. All right, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, over did you the have next anything? couple of weeks, please uh, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bean. Uh, Ms. Smith, did you have anything this evening for legislation? Uh, sure, I will try to make it fast. Can you hear me? Because I'm, my screens are going in two different places. Okay, go ahead. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, the virus has made it painfully obvious that some school districts in our state are 
far wealthier than others and have been able to provide remote learning to their students while others have been struggling, uh, not even to mention food and childcare, and obviously the list is endless. So the line that I really like is that the zip code a child lives in should not affect the quality or access to public education he or she receives. Having said that, there has been a call to the governor to establish what some have called a remote learning task force to look into the inequities. And the hope is that the task force will specifically identify the gaps that we are seeing in technology and instruction. So that's the first thing. And just the second thing that I thought that I would go over is Act 13 of 2020. And that was passed unanimously and it addresses many issues facing all of the challenges that we are currently facing in public education. So just for mainly the benefit of anyone who may be listening, I will just summarize those as quickly as I can. So the Act 13 of 2020 waives the mandatory 180 day requirement of school. The Secretary of Education has the authority to close schools until the pandemic has ended if he so chooses. Secretary of Education may increase the number of flexible instruction days. The Secretary of Education will waive uh, career and technical education hours using testing data in a teacher's yearly evaluation, pre-K counts hours, student teaching hours, which was 12 weeks and they did not complete that, assessment for NIMS and NOCTI, Insurance employees will be paid and retirement is not affected. Cleaning staff will have their supplies and material and clothing. Special education students with IEPs will be given a written notice of the school's plan to ensure faith. The school must maintain a good faith effort to plan for the continuity of education, submit that plan to the PDE and post the plan on the school's website. Schools will not receive less subsidy payments or payments from another school entity. Payments to charter and cyber schools will be based upon enrollment as of March 13th. Next is federal testing and accountability waiver was granted. Districts may apply for waiver because of staffing changes if instructional needs were impacted and 30 uh, Secretary of Education or the Department of Education has 30 days to respond. Continuing education um, requirements are extended by a year. Districts may renegotiate school bus contracts, which we will be talking about later. Um, and one note about the cyber charter school. Cyber charter schools can accept new students during the shutdown, but cannot be compensated for the new students during the shutdown. If the students stay after the shutdown and officially transfer to cyber charter schools or charter schools for the rest of the year, they will be paid from the date that the district opens. And as far as the uh, freezing of property taxes, it's so vague right now and I know very little about it, but Mr. Bean, I will be looking into it and I'm sure you and I will be in contact because that's pretty big and I imagine that would take some serious um, voting and consideration because everyone will be impacted. And that's the end of my report. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Ms. Smith? And if I misspoke and said anything incorrect, please feel free to correct me because most of you know as much as or more than I do about that. It was very thorough, thank you. All right, for my report, I uh, don't have anything official in uh, writing this evening. I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, uh, this meeting would not be possible without uh, Mr. Nepp and his uh, continued diligence on trying to make all this work and keep us within guidelines and recommendations. Uh, I know he's been working countless hours. Uh, it's not uncommon to see an email at two o'clock in the morning. So uh, thank you, Mr. Nepp, for that. Uh, he is hosting the meeting this evening and uh, doing a fine job at that, so thank you. And I uh, would also like to just really thank uh, administration, teachers, staff, everyone involved in uh, really putting together the continuity plan that we have, all the volunteers that are delivering meals and, and the planning sessions and, and vision sessions, et cetera. Everyone's really coming together as a community to make 
to make this happen within Belfont. And I know our model looks different than other districts, but there's also a lot of districts that uh, are somewhat similar. So sometimes uh, we all know that we're thankful, but it really needs to be said uh, more often than not. So I'd like to thank all those folks that are continuing every day to volunteer and, and make it all work out. So, and with that, uh, I would say that uh, the only other thing I had was the building committee. Uh, we had met with um, Hunt Architects and Engineers. We had a, um, an initial meeting with the committee and that was to uh, review initial findings of the condition of the four buildings uh, in our elementary, uh, our elementary buildings. Uh, they did go over some of the uh, some of the recommendations that they would have, as well as uh, a lot of the information that they're still looking for. They also uh, met with the uh, the principals of the uh, the four affected buildings, and uh, are now currently reviewing educational space needs uh, across the district and trying to identify um, differences, inequities, room for improvement, and then uh, that. I believe their next step is to bring that back to the administrative team to um, uh, sort of coalesce what we have versus where we need to go in the district. So uh, that should be all I have from the building committee. Are there any questions uh, on either of those? Mr. Gazar, um, for the building committee, has that, the names of that committee, are they, is that public or has that been shared widely? Uh, serving on I, that committee? I don't think it has. And I would also say that uh, I think what we'll do is put that up on the website. Uh, there's also been uh, at least one, possibly two podcasts now on the subject. So from the main website, if you, uh, there's usually a, like in, I think it's a red font at the top, there's an attention session or section. And within there, it talks about the uh, elementary program, either there or off to the right. I think there's an elementary tab. Mr. Knepp's looking for it here. So off to the side here where you see elementary building project. So anyone looking for information on that, this would be the place to go. It, uh, it brings in all of the information from the past and the work that um, Mr. Steiner and his committee uh, had done. And then uh, it looks like there are two podcasts now uh, with the new, the new uh, committee and with Hunt Engineering. So uh, what we're looking to do is underneath each of those podcasts, if anyone from the public would like to comment on anything they've seen in that individual podcast, we're looking to put a form there or a link that they can fill out and uh, add to the discussion. And I will also um, send a document in that we can put the membership of the committee in that location as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you for asking and reminding. Any other questions? Okay, with that, we'll move to uh, Dr. Saylor and her report. Uh, Rick, if you can pull it up, thank you. I'm not gonna read everything in this report. I'm going to highlight things as we go through here. Uh, we wanted to start with some good news. Our, our uh, professional staff association raised over $2,100 for the YMCA food program. And um, we wanna say thank you for doing this. You know, it's through all of us working together that um, these kind of things get done and our students and families get served. So we want to say thank you very much to our teachers for um, pulling this, this piece together. I want to talk a little bit of our continuity of education plan. We'll pull that plan up in a little bit, not right away, uh, but I wanna go through this report first. It was submitted to PDE on the 2nd of April. It is posted on our website. We did not include in our plan our um, work that our social workers and counselors have been undertaking. That's not a part of the official plan, but I feel it's very important to speak to. They've continued to reach out to our families to establish out working hours um, where families can contact them. They've continued to be available to our students. They've continued to make the contacts necessary to uh, connect our families with different support services throughout the community. And this is really, really critical um, to us weathering this crisis. In fact, I really believe that once we're through this crisis, our, our mental health pieces, our uh, social services pieces, they're gonna be needed more so than they have ever been. So um, um, extremely critical. I also wanted to talk a little bit uh, 
about um, where where everything where everything is on the on the website. Uh, again, Britt has made that very prominent on the home page for people to be able to access and view. I want to talk a little bit about grades. I know people are curious about the grades. Our grades for the third marking period are um, being compiled. Uh, logistically, it's a little bit more complicated than normal. Uh, we won't be able to send out report cards, but parents will be made aware when those grades are available in the portal. Um, parents, parents will be able to view them at that time and principals will be able to share specific information with families. It's important to understand that no student in the district will receive any file in a grade lower than a 60% for the third marking period. So if a student was originally failing the third marking period, they are not going to be failing the third marking period now. With the closure, uh, some of that third marking period time was cut off. Students would not have had the ability to necessarily make up work or engage in some of the things they had been engaged in. And we are not penalizing the students for that piece. It's absolutely not their fault. I want to touch base on the seniors also. They will be graduating on time, June 8th. That will not change. In fact, at the next board meeting, we'll be recommending to our board that um, we waive the district graduation requirements and just align with PDE requirements. Our requirements are greater than the state's. They're currently 25 credits versus 21. They also, um, ask us to make sure that we have uh, social studies and mathematics for four years, whereas the state only requires English for four years. We'd also be looking at waiving some pieces in driver's ed and leniency on um, health and PE, as well as some of the other credits that uh, elective credits we would normally require. Uh, the state has recommended leniency. We definitely agree to that bit on leniency. Our high school principals and counselors will be reaching out to those seniors who may have some individual difficulties or adjustments that need to be made. And again, they will be working with them to that effect. Again, no senior will be penalized for not being able to meet work that should have occurred during the mandated closure. And the high school, as far as graduation goes, right now with the latest guidance, uh, we're working on virtual graduation ceremony. The high school is working with their team. We wanna make sure we have a memorable and beautiful experience for our seniors. That's where they're working right now. Um, scholarships and academic awards will still be awarded. That will probably be a virtual ceremony as well. The senior award applications are posted on the high school website. So for anyone listening out there, if you have not look for that yet. If you're a senior and you need to um, get your hands on that application, that's where they are. Your counselors are also available to you for any questions. Obviously, prom has, prom has been postponed. The senior trip has been or will be shortly. It will be canceled. Um, they too are looking at different ways that they can um, engage prom, um, whether it be watch parties, whether it be something else virtual. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the high school reaches out to the students to see what they might be have ideas for on a virtual platform. But again, that is being addressed and being worked on right now. We did get some of our data back um, from technology. You can see the analysis. With smartphones and cell phones, it enables us to have probably about 96 to 97% access. Unfortunately, what we did find out when we did this survey is that we didn't get uh, a lot of in-depth information on the types of devices that families have in their homes, um, how that could or could not be complicated with multiple students uh, on video streaming at the same time, and um, the conflicts with some work schedules that the parents might have in engaging with the devices and the access to the data, as well as those parents who might have not have unlimited data or have um, some data plans that would not necessarily support what we may be looking to do. So those are questions that we, we do need to get answered and that's possibly where those phone calls to some of the families could come in handy. We did get some feedback up on the number of people who would request the, the Chromebooks um, and we have had some discussion around that. Uh, administrative team continues to have those discussions on almost a daily basis. 
they did do a pro con review and use of the distribution of Chromebooks. And you can read through that and you can see where the challenges are. And you can see what they've been working through. Um, and as I said, our administrative team continues to work on detailing a plan. What the administrative team is looking at possibly at this point um, with, we anticipate the closure on um, going obviously beyond April. Uh, gut tells us we probably will not be going back this year, but uh, of course that's not been um, announced. So that's just our gut reaction. So what we're looking at is um, how could we possibly distribute Chromebooks to the middle school students and do it in a manner that is also fiscally responsible because we also know that once we distribute these Chromebooks, chances, chances are pretty good that um, some of the Chromebooks they're not gonna be able to be serviced while they're out. Um, and currently we service approximately eight Chromebooks a day at the middle school for repairs. So we know that when we get these Chromebooks back, there's probably going to be a decent number that are going to have to be replaced. So what the tech department has been working on over the last week is figuring out how to mitigate that, how to minimize that, that cost, especially in light of what we, we see as a potential shortfall in revenues. And what they've come up with is the possibility um, in fifth grade and eighth grade, those uh, Chromebooks are cycled out because they at that point are beginning to reach their life and students receive a new Chromebook in sixth grade and ninth grade in the one-to-one -one, um, plan that we have. So in that case, if we were to take the fifth grade and the eighth grade Chromebooks, we would have enough to distribute to the middle school kids who requested a Chromebook. Now these would not be their Chromebooks. These would just be a Chromebook. But what would happen is if those Chromebooks were broken, if those Chromebooks um, became misplaced, if something happened to those Chromebooks, we wouldn't have to replace those Chromebooks because they would have been cycled out. So from the technology department, and, and Rick, you can step in here at the end of this report, they really feel that that would be a very feasible way to do it. If we were to dis if we were to distribute the Chromebooks, um, as we go down, I do talk about our our COE, our Continuity of Education Plan, which is review and enrichment. As we have said numerous times before, it is the model that all the schools in the IU are utilizing. Everyone is doing enrichment and review. Uh, several of the school districts in the intermediate unit are actually using our menu choice boards. When people talk about packets, that's um, necessarily, uh, it can mean a lot of different things. We also mail home our menus to those parents who have notified us and left us know that they need a hard copy mailed to them. We do, do, do that also. Uh, Students have the ability to gauge, engage in all the activities, whether online or offline. We want to make sure that our continuity of education plan was not technology dependent. The primary reason for that is for equity. Tammy can talk to you a little bit later about how those plans are evolving over time and the pieces that we're adding to them. In the continuity of education plan, you can actually see that we have our COE, which is the base layer that everyone gets, but we also have additional layers. Gina will be able to speak to you about the special education layer and our um, efforts to provide FAPE and equity uh, through our continuity plan and layers. There's also layers there that address our English language learners, that address our seniors, our seniors uh, dependent upon their individual circumstances, dependent upon the specific courses, would be receiving some more formalized instruction, um, especially our AP students and our college and the high school students. And the college and the high school is also dependent upon the partnering institutions. So um, with, for instance, with the University of Pittsburgh, we have numerous courses that are offered through Pitt. Every single department within the University of Pittsburgh handles their expectations differently. There is no consistency. So each of those classes are being handled differently depending upon the requirements that are coming forth from the department chairperson of the university. They're all, they all look a little bit different and they are additional layers to what is going on. For the Fourth marking period, as with all the districts in the area, we are strongly considering pass-fail grading, which is what also the um, state is recommending. And uh, again, that would be utilized in the fourth quarter. 
There is a PDE grant that will be opening up next week. It's only open, open, I mean, this week. It opened Monday. It'll be closing on Friday. We're meeting tomorrow to complete that grant. It could be, it will probably be in the area of $10,000, possibly a little bit more. Um, it can be more. Um, we're, we're assuming that's gonna be handled probably the same way the safety grant is where all the districts that apply get a little piece of it. But what we will be doing, we will be doing to uh, asking for additional Chromebooks. If we're only looking at $10,000, it may only be approximately 25 to 30 Chromebooks, but it will give us some to replenish what we have now on cycle so we can continue that one-to-one -one plan and possibly reappropriate uh, some of the money that we would have been using on Chromebooks for hotspots or some of those other pieces. With that said, Eric has also been working diligently to try to give us two access sites for additional um, internet connectivity within our parking lots, one in the high school parking lot, one in the Marion Walker parking lot. So we have some on both ends of the district. It's uh, complicated. Eric is running into some um, logistical problems with the high school. We're being bombarded with um, internet from all the other local businesses, which are interfering with our internet access, but he's trying his best. He's continuing to work on that so we can have that as an, an, another option. And I also want to mention, I thought it was important for, to let everyone know that Pennsylvania has created a new helpline for families or individuals who are struggling with anxiety and other challenging emotions during this health crisis. Um, it was created by the Department of Public Services. It's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the number here is in the report for state residents to um, call. Uh, we, really, we really are hearing about the increased need during this crisis for these services as families are struggling. And so we wanna make sure that that's available to everybody. Rick, if you can pull up the plan specifically. Thank you, Rick. Give me a moment here. My internet's going in and out, so I'm not seeing the screen. Okay, so what you have here is you have what has been submitted to the state. Um, you can see it is, is the overview of the plan is tied to the vision and mission. Again, it is review and enrichment, which as I said, all the districts, regardless of what you have heard, are in the IU are utilizing um, enrichment and review. The only places we're not utilizing or will not be using, utilizing uh, strictly enrichment and review as with the other schools is again with our seniors, with our AP, with our um, college in the classroom, um, with some uh, special, special needs kids that have special indicators. They will be on either our individualized plans or they will be on more formal instruction based upon the criteria of those classes. You can see that we've delineated um, where each part of our plan engages. Our K through five grade level plans cover all the core content areas. They also cover all the um, specialist areas and they also cover um, areas for mental health and social emotional learning. Six through eight also make sure it includes the world languages, it includes technology and project lead the way, it includes our fine arts. And nine through 12, is actually more course specific. If you go into their menus, you'll see that each of the courses, each of the teachers created something that was very specific to their courses and to their classes. So it's extremely um, well developed for what would be going on. And as I said, it adds an additional layer of learning for our special education students, for ELL students, for our seniors, and for those needing individual plans to um, be able to continue to meet their, their specific IEP goals. We're using a comprehensive platform of communication forums from social media to our district communication hub, which I wanna say was one of the first um, ones in the state to go up on our district website. Again, thank you, Brick and Britt, and thank you, Rick, for doing such a nice comprehensive job with that communication hub. I recommend everyone to visit it daily. It's continually updated. 
Also, our remote learning information hub on our district website was also one of the first to go up and numerous districts have copied it. I encourage everyone to go there and to be able to look at that. Um, I believe in the process and perhaps Tammy can speak to this more. Um, the older menus will be archived. The parents can continue, students continue to access them and the newer menus will be um, highlighted and um, brought forward with there. Uh, our teachers are using a host of ways to connect with our students from uh, YouTube to Zoom to Google Hangouts to FaceTime and Facebook, uh, all sorts of social media, phone calls, postcards, letters, and again, emails. Uh, we do hold our weekly Zoom meetings between our administrators, with our staff, with our professional organizations, with our instructional coaches, who I do have to give a shout out to here along with our teachers who have invested numerous hours and continue to invest numerous hours each week to make sure that those uh, menu choices are um, updated, they're aligned with the learning, and they're um, ensuring that we are pro providing the foundational skills necessary for our children to build off of. Our teachers do monitor their email and parents may continue to contact any of their teachers, principals or other administrators through their email. Um, that information is available on the district website. If you don't have a uh, contact email for someone, you can find it there. Our teachers at the high school also have office hours and those are posted on the office on the high school website. Um, right on that first page, you can go in there, you can see every teacher's office hours. They have three office hours per week as a minimum. And now that's in addition to all the other contacts that they're supposed to be making. And a parent or a student can contact them at any time for feedback on anything that they're working on. The same way at the elementary school. The middle school also has designated office hours and Summer does post them. Now the middle school, the high school's office hours are set. The middle school hours are a little more flexible and may change from week to week, but they are always posted and they are made available to our parents and to our students. We have uh, lifted our, listed our staff general expe expectations. These have been shared with the association. The teachers are well aware of these expectations and you can read through there. We have our support staff expectations. They're also well aware of the flexibility of being deemed essential or being taken off the essential uh, list depending upon what is necessary for the critical and essential functions of the district at any given time. And our administrators also have um, their expectations delineated here for the state. There's also the student expectations. And I really want to emphasize that. Well, by the state's definition, enrichment and review activities are optional. Um, that word optional is to be taken very lightly. It is the expectation of us that every student will make an effort to engage and complete assigned activities from the menu choice boards, either online or in paper format on a daily basis to their best of their ability. And again, um, the teachers and administrators ask for the support of the parents in doing this, understanding that um, everyone's schedules are complicated and not all parents are available all the time, which is why much of the menu choice, choice board is um, also self-directed. And students are expected with the support of their caregivers as necessary to reach out to their teachers for feedback or clarification. We're not sure that's happening as often as it should, but they are to reach out for them for, to, um, for, for that piece of information. Seniors are expected to adhere to the senior learning plan when the high school gets in touch with them and rolls it out. Um, and they are expected to meet the state level graduation requirements. Again, most of them, if not all of them, are well on track to meeting that since our district expectations are much higher than the state's expectation. Uh, as we said, uh, the COE does not require attendance. It does not, we do not do grading. Um, that's part of review and enrichment. However, we do provide feedback. And for the fourth marking period, there is pass fail. Good faith efforts for 
access and equity for the students are being met. We've worked with our solicitors to this effect. We've gotten review, we got in feedback from PDE and from our intermediate unit and technical assistance so that we know we are meeting those pieces. Uh, Dr. McFalls can speak specifically to the special education supports. I know her and her team have been working 36 hours out of 24 hours, if that's possible, to make sure that this is a very robust part of our plan. And again, she can give you some very in-depth information on that. The EL supports too, kudos to, we only have two English um, language learning teachers. They're actually translating menu boards in the languages necessary for those students that need it so they can engage this at home. Tremendous work that's going on. You can read here for gifted um, education. Gifted is another area where it can go beyond review and enrichment based upon the student's individual needs so we can meet their goals. We have the building grade level contacts here. Um, obviously, any of these people can be contacted anytime regarding the continuity of en uh, education plans that are going on in their building or any other concerns parents may have regarding their children. And we have additional resource links here, some that are required by the state, some that we have added because we think they are necessary um, to our communication to our, our parents. And that is a very brief overview of the continuity of education plan. And um, I will open up questions for that. And I will ask uh, Gina and Tammy to step in so they can speak more specifically about it since they have both been um, integral to the development of this plan. Tammy and her work with the teachers and the coaches and developing it, and Gina with her work with the teachers and, and developing the special education plan. And that's it for my report. Thank you, Dr. Saylor. Um, let's see, before we get into questions or discussions on that, I didn't have uh, Dr. McFalls, I did not have you on the uh, agenda under reports. Would you like to just uh, add to that anything in your uh, area of expertise? Sure. Um, the timelines haven't been changed at all for special education. So we are continuing to have IEP meetings and reevaluations. The state has governed how we need to put into place if we're unable to conduct evaluations because we obviously don't have access to the students. So that has, of course, created a lot of paperwork for um, our teachers who um, really are doing a great job. So they're reaching out. We get, I give them additional support if they have questions on how to do that paperwork so that all that's being done virtually. Essentially, the continuity of education plan still fits into the whole of special ed. That would kind of be what we're doing for general education. But then we have a free appropriate public education requirement. And we also, like the continuity of education plan, have to make a good faith effort to provide services to students. So our intermediate unit is providing OT, PT, vision, and hearing services to those students. Um, they have reached out to our families and we are required to put in writing a notice of what services are being provided. I think one of the greatest things that people need to understand is with special ed, because everything is very individualized and because this is all new to everyone, the services are going to look a lot different at times. There may not be as much service. There may be service that's delivered in a different way, or sometimes there may be services, depending on the nature and the severity of the disability, that can't be de delivered. So we are doing our best to be as transparent with parents as we can in our letters um, and reaching out to them and saying, here is how things need to be done. Um, we also have parents that reach out and say that they are you know, feeling overwhelmed. And our guidance has been the same as what it has been for the continuity of education plan. You're entitled to these services. We encourage you to take advantage of those particular services, but do the best that you that you can. For those students who are unable to get their um, information virtually, we have developed a plan and I must stress that we want to keep paper at a minimum because the guidance from the federal government and the state government and through our solicitors has been really to keep people safe. 
So if we need to mail paper packets out, we are doing that at a, at a minimum um, and only if there is not a virtual option for those particular students. The teachers have been incredibly creative. We are running reading groups at elementary, middle, and high school. Teachers are getting reading passages together. They're getting math work together for students. Um, they're keeping office hours and working with their general education colleagues if they need to um, partner for certain things. Um, we're doing emotional and autistic support services through YouTube videos um, for teachers that are interfacing and running individual groups with their students. So I can't say enough of what they have done in a very, very short period of time. And their level and commitment to, to students with disabilities has been beyond amazing. And everybody's working together, including the principals to help everyone navigate through this um, time. So the principals are serving as um, the building representatives during IEP meetings. And we are doing the IEP meetings through phone and through Zoom if, if the parents are able to do that. So that's really an overview of what we're doing in, in special education. Does anyone have any questions? I will say, uh, Dr. McFalls, that we received some of those services and uh, it is nice that they have flexibility to offer over several different platforms. Um, thank you, that's nice to hear. Uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. My teachers email me and tell me that the parents are grateful to have the services that they're getting. Um, and they know that our teachers are doing the best that we can. So again, my feedback at, mid uh, at middle school, elementary and high school uh, by and large has been very positive. And I'm, I'm pleased and, and that really is to the credit of the teachers really going into overdrive during this. I have to say that guidance from um, has changed a lot. It changes frequently. And I, I tell my teachers that up front. Uh, we're having a session with the IU tomorrow because we thought we had everything all ironed out and then PDE put out more information. So it is likely to change. So we're being flexible, we're rolling with it. We can't control it. And we just try to push it out and be as transparent um, as we can. I have created, because there is so much information, we actually have a drive with various um, procedures and protocols that our teachers can follow. You know, how do you set up a virtual meeting? Um, how do you deal with teachers who, who are unable to come? You know, we follow the same kinds of uh, kinds of things. There are questions and answers that we've gotten about, um, you know, what are the legalities around Zoom? And, um, you know, can you work one-on-one -on -one with the student? Can you work in small groups? So the, the teachers can actually access that information because obviously there are a lot of legal issues as we, uh, as we kind of wade into the special ed piece of things. So they've been great. They followed through with things. And like I said, I guess I would just tell parents, uh, go, go to your learning support teacher first. And then if there are any further things that are not addressed, please bring them to my level and I'm happy to address those as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. McFalls? Okay, thank you again. And uh, are there any questions for uh, Dr. Saylor before we move on? I, I just wanted to ask about, I mean, I heard what you said about the Chromebooks and I'm curious about um, the breakdown of 450 parents, how many um, families that, um, or how many students that represented and also um, if there's a breakdown, I, mean, I know now at this point, it sounds like you're looking at solely just the middle school, but I, I do know of families that have reached out to me that have elementary children that are, are hopeful to also obtain the, the Chromebooks. And so I'm curious about the thinking on that. And as we look at a prolonged um, closure, not having that resource available while it's not required by the continuity of education plan, arguably a lot of the things are on the choice menus do, do require a device of some type. Just curious about the thinking on that and how a um, move this forward and when we might be able to likely see it move forward. 
we've, we've talked about that, Julie. Um, there's some things, and there's some things that are going to come on the board's shoulders that you guys are going to have to vote on and approve because there will be financial components to this. As we talked about, um, we're going to have to make sure that we allocate look at the elementary at some point, we are going to make sure that we have to allocate money for replacing um, of those Chromebooks. Um, those 450, well, that was the number as of the time this report had to be filed. I believe it's a little bit more. I think there's like 207, 270. Uh, Rick would have to jump in exactly with that number at the middle school. And we have enough fifth grade and eighth grade Chromebooks to cover that number at the middle school. So we wouldn't have to worry about any um, fiscal repercussions with dis distribution of those books and uh, Chromebooks. Because again, we will not be able to service them or repair them for them during the closure. Um, we were also looking at the middle school um, primarily because during this closure right now with the stay at home order, we can't require our parents to come pick things up. We wouldn't do that. Um, I don't wanna put anyone in that position. I don't wanna live with the guilt that I brought someone out into a public space and now they have the virus and they potentially end up in the hospital or, or worse. Um, so uh, what we're, we're looking at with the middle school, we can potentially run bus runs or run van runs to actually uh, get those Chromebooks out to the students. Hopefully if, if, if all goes well um, by the end of next week, if we start looking at the elementary school, it's a more complicated process. It'd probably be uh, two to three times, well, it would obviously be uh, three times, probably three times more in the number of Chromebooks that are needed. And again, um, you know, we will be doing the breakdown of the potential cost analysis, but we would have to bring that to the board for approval to um, be able to prove, uh, prove that potential before we would move forward. This Thank is you. Rick. I, this is Rick. I can't speak specifically to the number of requests we have received. Of the 458 requests, Bald Eagle Elementary has requested 171. Benner Elementary has requested 78. Marion Walker has requested 132. Pleasant Gap Elementary has requested 84. And the middle school has a total number of requests currently of 213. Thanks, Rick. And I think uh, you're, you're, you have our uh, friendly neighbors on your mind when you mentioned Bald Eagle Elementary. I think you meant Belfont Elementary. Yeah, can yes. you Belfont Elementary and Mary Walker again? Because I got a little confused. With the yes, for, for Belfont Elementary, there are uh, total of 171 requests. And what was the other one? Marion Walker. Marion Walker, we have 132 requests. So oh, Sarah, you... oh, sorry. Go, I'm sorry. Go, go, go ahead, Donna. So are you just talking about only allowing middle school students to get their Chromebooks or just using the middle school Chromebooks to give to anyone who requests them? No, right now we're just looking at um, getting them out to the middle school students. Again, because as I said, we, we have fifth grade, where we're looking at um, the cost analysis. This is what was brought up in the administrative um, discussions that we had. Um, again, the Chromebooks will not be repaired or serviced while they're out in the hands of our families. We know that even when they're in school, we, have to, we do an average of eight repairs a day on a Chromebook. So we extrapolate and make the assumption that uh, when the Chromebooks go out, uh, when they come back in, we're probably going to have at least 25% that will probably need to be replaced. Um, Given, given that we want to uh, minimize the cost to the district, uh, the, you know, uh, I know Rick has said anywhere between 250 and 350 on a Chromebook. It, it varies by vendors and what, what they can get. And so we, what we do when we cycle through our um, technology and our one-to-one -one plan, students get a new Chromebook when they enter sixth grade and they get a new Chromebook when they enter into ninth grade, which means the Chromebook that now will belong to our current fifth graders 
and um, our current eighth graders would be cycling back. At the end of this year, those Chromebooks would be going into recycling. They would be replaced with new Chromebooks. That's something that's already budgeted for. That's something that's already in our plan. So the technology department um, with their insight suggested, well, we take those fifth grade and eighth grade Chromebooks and those are the ones that we distribute. We don't have to worry about any potential fiscal um, uh, problems moving forward because technically we wouldn't have to add new additional Chromebooks to that, to that number because they're already accounted for. If we go out further than that and we distribute, let's say another 400, 450 Chromebooks, we need to understand as a board and as a district, we may have to buy 100 or 150 Chromebooks that aren't budgeted for, for the start of next year to um, take care of the ones that we know will come back um, with significant need for repair or may not even come back. Uh, we, we know that although we will be asking, we will, there will be some things that we would also be doing with this and the board needs to understand this piece too. Um, it, it's not filtered, our, our, um, our internet is not filtered at the elementary or middle school level. We could spend approximately, I think Rick said, approximately $3,000 for additional licenses if we wanted to put them one, um, that would be a more, it would take a little more time. So we would have to um, get those licenses and then get the, get the, get them implemented onto um, our Chromebooks. Um, but without fair. that, there's no monitoring of it. So the parents would have to be solely responsible for any content that their children come across. Um, and the school would not be accountable for that. So parents would need to be aware and the school board would need to be um, aware of, of that piece also. So that, that's also a, a consideration. It was something that weighed heavily on our administrators' shoulders because they know that there's a lot of um, outside of school, there's uh, you know that technology type of bullying that goes on and it, it bleeds into the school. And when students are in school, we're able to address it. When students are in school and we're under this closure, we can't address it. So that again would be the parent's responsibility to undertake that. So the parents would have to be aware of all these additional implications and we would work with Dr. Etter to um, draw up a new acceptable use plan that addresses all of this, which the parents would need to um, agree to prior to receiving the Chromebook. So there are these logistical pieces that everyone needs to be aware of that are a little bit different than if you were to have a Chromebook under um, the normal circumstances of a school being open. I hope I ran some things together, so I hope that makes sense. Go ahead, Rick. I just wanted to clarify, we do filter the Chromebooks for ele elementary and middle school while they, while they are at our schools. Those oh. devices we did not get licenses for that we, th we have this uh, program called Go Guardian at the high school that does a number of things as far as managing the Chromebook, Chromebooks in a one-to-one -one take home scenario. One, we can filter those devices when they go home and two, we can track them if they're stolen and, and, and stop them from working if they're stolen. Uh, we do not, we never purchase those licenses for the middle school or the high school, our middle school or elementary school program. Thanks for clarifying that. and. Uh, yes, yeah, so you're you're still filtering while they're in the elementary and middle school, but it's, the filtering is done through our internet access. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, this is Mrs. Bruckner. Um, I I feel very strongly about the Chromebooks. I think that the uh, parents and families that would like to have them, I think they should have them. I think part of an agreement, we have them sign an agreement saying that they return and. Uh, Dr. Eider, you can let me know if this can be done, uh, that they return the Chromebooks in the condition uh, that they were given out. Um, they also understand that there aren't any uh, specific filters that they would take responsibility for what their students are viewing, uh, different things like that. So um, I, you know, I just want to state that I do feel strongly that the families that would like to have a Chromebook, I think should be able to, to get their Chromebook. 
I certainly don't have an issue with the latter part of what you just said with respect to a notice to them that we don't have the filters or the level of filters that we do have them. I was unsure exactly where that conversation ended up with what Rick said we could or could not do. Uh, with respect to, we can certainly say that they'll be responsible for any damage beyond normal wear and tear. And I'm assuming that we do that when it's issued to them for school use as well. Is that the case? That is correct. Dr. Okay, Seller, I have a, a couple of questions uh, for you. Um, the first is uh, actually related to the connectivity of the teachers and, and staff as well. It's not just a, a, an issue for, for the students and parents. Um, we have a bunch of uh, teachers that may live in very rural areas that don't have connectivity. Are we providing um, equipment and, and other cellular devices through the, the school so that those teachers can remain in contact with their students for their, their uh, service hours and um, Zoom meetings and other things? Well, what we have, Mark, is um, you know, this, the teachers have set up their plan so that it can um, uh, engage what access they, they have. We do have uh, teachers that have very unstable access. Um, I'm an example. I'm, I'm, I'm totally surprised I've been able to stay on this most. I've only been lost once tonight. Um, in my area of the district, we have um, very limited accessibility and it's extremely unstable. Um, there have been teachers that have contacted me and you know, said, hey, am I doing enough? I really feel bad. I want to do more, but I can't do more. We know that the MiFi devices are on back order. Um, it's tough to get them right now. Everybody wants to get them. Um, we're hoping that teachers that need it might be utilizing their hotspots that you know, Verizon and ATT have given them at this point in time. Um, some of our teachers, quite frankly, don't want to use any of their personal equipment. They don't want to use their personal cell phones. They don't want to release any personal information or personal numbers. It's a privacy issue with them. So, you know, we're working through, through that piece too. And then here's the other piece that everyone has to remember. And I know some people probably don't want to hear it, but um, our staff, it's not like our staff, it's not like it's a normal um, uh, delivery of remote education. It's not, not by any means. Um, you know, someone uh, like me who doesn't have any children, I can sit in my little home office and I can work from seven to midnight, you know, just with taking care of my puppy, right? But our teachers are not in that situation. Our, we have a very young staff. Most of our teachers have children of their own who uh, daycare is not open. Um, you know, teachers are not considered part of the Healthcare, they're not considered part of the critical need for the people who get to have the extra daycare. So they have their children at home too, who they have to watch and they have to take on their parental responsibilities for. So they're juggling their need to take care of their own families with their need to re, re, um, maintain the continuity of learning and education for our students. And quite frankly, it's become um, a very, uh, difficult situation for many of our teachers. So thank you for asking that. You know, there are the technology aspects that we have to continue consider, and there are the family logistics that we need to consider. Um, and I know people don't like to look at those, both those pieces necessarily. You look at things just through your own lens. But there are a lot of lenses that need to be um, looked through. So thank you, Mark. No problem. Yeah, I was watching a, a video chat today from the PSBA and the, the Brook, Brookville um, uh, Area School District. They had given all the, the teachers burner cell phones. So for this period that they, they could uh, publicize those uh, contact numbers, for it, for example. The, 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 second, the second question I had, uh, and maybe uh, Tammy's going to bring this up, is the, uh, I'd say that the, the, the continuity education plan was a lot more comprehensive this week and I really appreciate the, the way that it looked. Um, but there's some additional um, resources that are available. I know that the um, Secretary of Education has made free of charge platforms like Odyssey Wear and Edgenuity and there's things like the Khan Academy. Are you, for those parents and students that want real, a lot of 
extra stuff, uh, you're going to be able to put links to that uh, information um, so that they could pick and choose a la carte for, for uh, extra. Um, yeah, actually, that information's already posted. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure where it's posted. So from my perspective, it's not visible enough, um, but it's already posted. And quite honestly, um, the information that the secretary has made available, and Tammy will talk to this, you know, um, we've looked into, we've looked at that uh, uh, stuff. It's it's um, really, it's not formal instruction. It's just uh, modules that you would undertake, uh, really no different necessarily than what our teachers are offering through the menu board, just through a different platform. What I would recommend to parents, I would strongly recommend to parents that may be looking for something additional if they have the capacity to do so, I would recommend the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy is an amazingly free platform and it's intuitive in some ways. And it takes your, your children where they are, um, moves them based upon how they're doing. And it, I believe it also offers some additional personal support if you need it. So the Khan Academy is something that's been out there for a very long time. It's tied to the college board now. So it has a lot of AP pieces to it. Um, it, it's something that people really, really should be taking a look at if they want those extra enrichment pieces. I know I used it when Jack was trying to do his high school physics to relearn physics. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing um, So Dr. Siller, I had another question about, so I know the teachers, um, have been getting together to put together the, <clears throat> excuse me, the boards. Now, is there an expectation that both teams, like so at the middle school, there's red teams and white teams. So is there an expectations that all the teachers in a grade level are doing things the same way, like holding Zoom meetings or reaching out to the students is, or is it just up to each individual teacher? There's an expectation that the continuity of education, the plan, it Itself. The learning piece is um, equal and equitable for all students. The, the piece is as far as contacting the, the, the students, there's a minimum expectation and there's the expectation that you move beyond the minimum and many of our teachers are moving beyond the minimum, but how they contact the, the students is, is really based upon um, the teacher's capability and capacity to do so. And we have a spreadsheet so we know how all the teachers are um, uh, telling us they're reaching out to their students. We have a six page spreadsheet that lists all the different ways that they're interacting. I will tell you that some teachers are phenomenal in their interactions and are interacting every day, you know, holding those Zoom meetings on reaching out and by phone calls to those students that don't have internet access or choose not to access that way. I can tell you that some teachers are doing the bare minimum. You know, um, it's even been, uh, I hate to say this publicly, but it's even been a push to get them to do something beyond their quote unquote office hours. Um, our principals are working with them. They're, they're moving them, um, but um, not all the teachers are on the same page. They are all on the same page. The expectation is all on the same page as far as the learning, the continuity of learning but how they're reaching out varies. But Tammy can talk to you a little bit more about the specific process of how the coaches are, are working with the different departments and the different teachers on this and actually organizing those constructive virtual meetings and workshops where they're working together to create the material that's, that's distributed through our plans. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to say something. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, our weekly choice boards. I understand the process of not wanting to mail things out. I totally get that because of cross-contamination and stuff. However, if someone does not have internet access, it would be very challenging for them to get the choice board. And yes, I understand you said that people have called to ask for them to be mailed out but not everybody is going to take that initiative. We all know that. I really believe Kim, Kim, that we should be- Let me jump in here. No, you cannot. Let me... I, whoa, 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 you whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You may be quiet until hang, I finish talking. Kim, wait, ho hold on. So let me just say to, to everyone involved, we, we're having you know, civil discourse here. We're having reasonable conversation. So 
let's just uh, let each speaker finish and do so in a respectful manner and uh, move it forward. So Kim, if you could continue, please. So I'd like to see them mailed out. I understand, like I said, the cross contamination. Second, I am with Kristen on the fact that I do believe that if the Chromebooks, the Chromebooks need to go out. I'm a little disappointed that we are in week four and we're still having the conversations with the Chromebooks. I'd really like us to take, be as quick as we can with getting them out. And I understand also the financial cost with mailing them out. Mail, and I'm going back to the choice boards, mailing them out. I understand the financial cost, but right now, I'm more concerned with making sure all of our students are getting everything that they need so they can be enriched and have continued review. So, go ahead. Your microphone, Dr. Saylor. Our principals actually called the families to see who actually needed them and who didn't need them and the, who could pick them up and who was, that was getting them with their lunches and who wasn't. And those, they are being mailed out. So that has been being done. That is as it's being done. We're not worried about the financial costs whatsoever with mailing them out. We were talking about the financial costs with replacement of the Chromebooks that we know will come back damage because we also know in this in this time where there's going to be families that don't have jobs they've lost some of their income they're not going to be able to pay to replace that chromebook even if we tell them that they're responsible for it we know what reality is so we as a district have to be able to say that we're going to assume that cost and we're going to make sure that we budget accordingly for it so we can do that so we can continue with our our one-to-one -one program and have the uh, necessary devices that we need for the start of the school year hopefully that we are back for for that school year so so that's where they are it's not it's not with the mailing they are being they are the want parents that need them the families that need them they are being mailed out okay kim did you have thank anything you. else there no thank you okay thank you are there any other questions for dr saylor uh, dr saylor oh, oh go ahead um, it's, it's Donna Smith. I wanted to know if, since it's a choice or, I mean, we're not, we're hoping that students do something that they can do to what degree they want. Can a student move ahead with the curriculum if they so choose, even though we understand it's not graded, but instead of, let's say, you know, if it was, I have two kids, my, my son would have, I would have had to have pushed him, but my daughter, she might have wanted to finish what they were doing in social studies that year, language arts. Could they? Could we offer the rest of the curriculum and let the students know these are the units that we would have been doing if you would like it to continue instead of the parents trying to find the curriculum or the students? Here it is. You can do it. You can work on it. Here's the online book. If you want my feedback, we were going to do this report, this project, read this novel, answer these questions. Could they Donna, go ahead and do that? Donna, Tammy will talk to this a little bit. What, by the very nature of the state's definition of review and enrich, enrichment, we cannot introduce new content as part of the instruction, all right? That doesn't mean there can't be additional enrichment activities. And that's what Tammy's going to talk to you about. So I think she's going to be answering your question. She might not be using the language that you're using because based upon the definition of what we can and cannot do, there's different language that we use. But I think she's going to be addressing your concerns when she speaks to that. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I was going to ask too, uh, we may not have the data, but do we have data about um, the uh the analytics of how many people are accessing the boards um or even the number of paper copies that have gone out uh anything to kind of assess how people are engaging we'd have the number of the paper copies that have gone out all the principals would have that um uh primarily uh, mrs krish 
um, Mr. Vankus and Mr. Besh have been pretty much making the copies for the entire district. So they would have those numbers. I know Britt was looking at the analytics. I don't have the analytics. I don't know if she has them compiled yet. I don't know how much she can or cannot take off the Google platform, but I know her and Arlen were working on getting those numbers. And what kind of timeline are you looking um, at possibly, uh, you've mentioned kind of going to like more of a Swift model, like where, at what point you maybe see that happening? I know you mentioned probably in the next couple of weeks that yeah. that this closure might be longer. Um, yeah, I mean, so, I'm So where is that like, because I'm hearing from a lot of parents that there's just not rigor rigor and structure they're looking for for a lot more than what the choice boards are offering them well right I, I would argue there is rigor and i, and I know we and have a lot of talent in history and <laughs> to be sending folks to khan academy and other places i i would argue julie that there is rigor and structure um i would argue that it it's is much it's self-directed learning so there needs to be um supports and and motivation there you know just like if you were doing things online there needs to be support and motivation there so i would argue that's going to vary by family because we've heard a lot of very positive feedback also you know um so i just want to i just want to make sure that i put that out there now the flipped idea is is not something that um we have fully discussed with the teachers it's something only something that i began to broach with tammy um just recently and again we have to figure out what that means from an equity standpoint because that a flipped classroom as you know means that there is um more responsibility on a student to undertake some things on their own outside of the classroom so they can engage in discussion or um a, a work workshop per se during the teacher time the teacher's not doing the instruction or the lecturing so that's also something that our teachers would need to be um, trained in. Not all of our teachers have the skill set or the knowledge to do a flipped classroom. That's something we would be exploring. That's something that State College is exploring. Quite frankly, in my last conversations with Bob on Monday, they don't have it yet. They're not there yet themselves either. Um, that's something that we could look towards. Again, it's still enrichment and review. State College is still enrichment and review. We would still be in enrichment and review, but it's a different structure in access. So again, that's something that, um, you know, Tammy would look at with the coaches and whether or not we have capacity to get that piece up and running in a timely manner. Um, in any case, one of the things that Tammy is going to be looking at as far as professional learning over this point in time is, is helping our teachers gain more access to um, uh, workshops or virtual um, classrooms, uh, webinars, where they can get some of these skills during this period of time that we have, because in essence, it is a gift of time that we have where we can do some more professional learning that we otherwise could not have done. We do know of about 44 teachers who have engaged in one or more of the IU's online classes um, with regard to um, online learning. Uh, we know that Arlen has offered uh, a myriad of opportunities to um, gain these skills that our teachers have not taken advantage of. So we've talked about in this time period, do we, we create a menu for our teachers of courses and options that they are required to take and engage in during this period of time so that um, should we be caught in this situation again, it's not a question of, of capacity or the ability of our teachers to do it. You mentioned State College. So State College is an enrichment and in, in review period. I they are they had... No, they are enrichment and review. All the IUs, all the schools in this IU are enrichment and review. They may couch it differently, but everyone is enrichment and review. Now again, I, I caution that with saying that just like us, you know, and they may be a little bit further along in their delivery. I believe Bob was going to try to roll things out this week, whereas we're looking at rollout of next week. You know, with their seniors they're doing a little bit more, like us with AP and college in the classroom, that will have a, a very different look. He's going to be trying to do some things a little bit later with the high school. He's definitely said they're not there yet with the element for the elementary by any means. But some of the things that they're trying could be some of the things that that we try as our teachers gain the skills to be able to do it. 
um, State College, um, one of their um, professional learning pieces last year was looking at the flipped classroom. So some of their teachers have had training in it, whereas um, our teachers, for the most part, have not yet. I was just, I was going to say though, I, I, State College is requiring, and I believe they are taking attendance, and and there are asynchronous. Um, asynchronous modules that students are completing and I thought it was new curriculum from what I understood from colleagues that have students and no not from what not from what we've been told that's been shared with so, us in our um, regular meetings we meet every Monday Wednesday and Friday as a, a group across the the three county area interesting um, I'll have to follow up and if I get some maybe they can forward some emails to me of, of what they have received as parents as they've been receiving more it seems like more than what what we have currently the other question i did have was is there any concern by the administration of students that might be uh, who feel like a parent that might not feel they're getting what they want for their students that might be looking to go to a cyber school instead is there any is that on the radar at all have there do we have any data of students that might be leaving during this time for us um cyber education yeah. um for Minimal. that more structured uh kind of advancement we have and one special is that a fear for that they might continue there no i don't think i mean it's on our radar i don't think it's a fear um we have one special education student who um, um, asked about it, um, ironically, a special education student. And we've had a few students who asked about Bella, you know, and that's something else that we have talked about once we're able to get Bella back up and running as Bella, because right now it would be review and enrichment just like any other um, cyber charter school that went that route with continuity of education. Some have, some will be. Um, once we're once we're able to get that up and running if the board is again willing to support additional licenses and and pieces because what was being offered free is not um moving anything forward it's basic math and basic um english it's it's nothing that would advance the curriculum so it's not something we would want to look at anyway if we were looking at that that um type of instruction but if the board is willing to support uh, additional licenses, we can always open Bella up. And then those kids that are a fit for online learning, because again, we have to remember not every child can do online learning. And we find that out through Bella ourselves because there's you know, a good number of students that we bring back into the traditional classroom because they just cannot be successful through Bella. But we would need additional supports for Rebecca in that regard. And if we had the licenses, we, we could open, we could definitely open up that um, mode of learning. Well, I think some parents might be interested in looking at that, but I, I do also think um, I've talked to other folks and maybe Kim might be even able to um, comment on this. I thought Bald Eagles also moved to formal instruction um maybe uh, monday I, I think over this coming week that they're moving towards that and so i'm hearing from a lot of parents that they're concerned about what we're doing compared to what our neighbors are doing and so just trying to clear clear that up um so we know what's happening in our neighboring districts and we are not lagging behind what others are and we're doing on par of what they are but there's no. some disconnect no, there where we're not, um, Bald Eagle is still doing enrichment and instruction. They are not going to plan formal instruction. What's probably getting confused here is the language that the state uses versus what is being translated to the parents. Now, they may be utilizing some synchronous or asynchronous learning or some Zoom connections that are tied with um, the activities that they're doing, but they're still, based upon what we were told by uh, Dr. Clapper yesterday, they are still doing enrichment and review and they are not doing planned instructional learning as what as the state designates it. Uh, I got a couple questions, uh, more long range. Uh, and again, in the context that there's a, a lot going on right now, things are changing and evolving every day. Everyone is still in scramble mode just to get caught up to the moment. Uh, but is there any sense in terms of uh, if the schools remain closed out through the remainder of this school year, 
Um, will every all the students advance to the next grade going into the next school year? Yes, Jeff, they will. Every student's going to advance. And it's that point that we'd be, um, actually the teachers are, will be in the process before then of re-reviewing, of reviewing the curriculum and adjusting the curriculum to what we need to make sure is included as part of that transition at the beginning of the year of the new year. But yes, all the students will advance. Um, that's, that's guidance. That's also, that was our plan. That's also guidance by the state. So part of uh, the year long uh, curriculum that all the teachers are going to do, they're going to back in some of what the students didn't get over the course of the, uh, the school year. Okay. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, is it possible to do kind of an Apollo kind of project? Um, to get the district to the point where uh, prepare the district for the potential that we might not even be able to open up schools in at the beginning of September, or if we're going to have shutdowns, rolling shutdowns of some sort uh, as we progress through the next school year, to be able to do functional, formal instruction at the start of the next school year? I'm not sure. Jeff, only because we run into equity issues as far as, and when I talk about equity issues, I don't mean equity to a device. A student can have a device, but still not be able to access the learning. So what we our plan has to be more, it can't be as simple, here is um, a device and here's online learning. It has to be some sort of hybrid model where we can make sure that we are meeting the needs of all the students or we're going to broaden the equity gap and the learning gap rather than close it. So it's gotta be extremely, extremely well thought out in that hybrid model. I know our, our administrators and our coaches and our teachers, that's on their radar. That's something that we're looking at because quite frankly, from what we're hearing now, um, some states are talking about not even going back in the fall. You know, some states are talking about, as you said, these rolling shutdowns. You know, the CDC, who they're talking about the potential of a second round of this virus. Should we not have the, you know, um, the vaccines or the medications that are effective in place before we come around to fall again? So um, given what they're saying, I think it's reasonable to think that this is not the end. You know, this will occur again. And that is on their, that is on their radar. And that is something they are looking at to make sure that they can engage something to that effect should this occur again. All right, don't want to press it anymore. Just wanted to kind of get that out there and get a sense of things. I know there's so much that, that we need to get dealt with in there now. So thank you. Thank you. Any other I, questions for I Dr. Saley? I was just going to say, this is a follow up because we covered a lot, a lot of questions, but so, so Chromebooks, we're talking about probably for middle school students, you said maybe in the next week. Yeah, I would hope that we can work something out and figure out how to, um, you know, get that information from Scott, get that stuff down, figure out how we're going to um, get it electronically so that we have that sign off and then um, get um, you know, these runs out to the um, students. And I would, I'm, I'm hoping, okay, my, my administrative team might be sitting there glaring at me now, I don't know. But my hope would be that we could get it out by late next week. And then, and then the guidance from hearing board support and interest in trying to make it available to anybody. I mean, looking, looking at ways that we might be able to, to do that um, will also be something, I guess, that we can hear more about. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like our tech department to do an analysis. I'd like them to work with um, Mr. Bean and do a financial piece and see what the potential costs are to the district. Because then I would like the board to be able to um, you know, yay or nay officially on it before we would move to that larger um, capacity, if that makes any sense. And then I'll forward, I, I'm going to get a couple of colleagues to send me some emails because I do, do think that at least what parents are being told sounds like it in other districts is different than what 
you may be hearing at the superintendent level. So maybe in forwarding those, we can understand a little bit better where that difference is because it does very much sound like what um, colleagues are telling me is that other schools in our area, our neighboring schools are doing mandatory um, instruction, formalized instruction, at least six through 12. I don't know about elementary, but at least six through 12 um, with uh, kind of a hybrid models with mm -hmm. synchron asynchronous sessions for content and then synchronous sessions for added help and, and whatnot. So just trying to get some clarity to know how, how we fit in the region. So I can forward some of those to you and, and maybe as a board, we can understand better the language that's being used in our, in our neighboring areas would be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's what absolutely, because I can for. tell you, I can tell you point blank that every single superintendent has said enrichment and review and every single superintendent has said, I quote, no planned formal instruction. So I, I would assume that it's the interpretation of the platform um, and, and what's going on and how that varies and how that differs. So let me just add to that, that uh, if there's any doubt, uh, it's required by now that it be published on any district's webpage, what their plan moving forward is. So that should be easily accessible to the public by going to any particular district's webpage because it is mandatory that it be published by the PDE. So that yeah. might be another thing. Yeah, John, I have to jump in there. When we published ours, we were we were told at that time that it had to be up and running and published, submitted by Friday. So we had our plan, so we did it. And then the state extended it, I think maybe until April 17th, I'm not sure. So you might not see some of the others on there's at our, at our meeting yesterday when we talked about the plans, um, not all the districts had it up yet. Like for instance, some of the districts were still dealing with the special education part. They all had the enrichment re and review part. You will see that, I, I can tell you now, you will see enrichment and review to a T. Um, but again, I caution that because there's some variance, like I've said before tonight, in what is being done with the seniors, what is being done with the advanced classes at the high school level, um, Keystone might be exploring what they're looking at, maybe possibly including juniors in that, maybe sophomores they haven't decided yet. So there will be some variation there. There will be very little variation whatsoever at the, at the elementary level. You know, like I said, platforms could be different, but enrichment and review will, will not. Um, but you will, but I would say by the end of April, you will be able to go to the websites and see everybody's plan. Unless again, the state extends that again for some, some reason un, unbeknownst to us at this point in time. Well, one Thank thing you. I do, oh, sorry. Go John. ahead. No, it's okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, one thing I did uh, talk to a few uh, folks uh, that their kids go to Penns Valley. Um, they do have enrichment activities and then the teachers are asking the students to turn in those so that not for grading, but as of right now, not for grading, um, but that the teachers can review and ask questions and things like that. So what's, do we have a plan uh, for that to do it's a, something similar? It's a similar? feedback plan they have. We have told our teachers that they should be providing feedback to the students. But again, our plan is where the students have to also take responsibility to engage with the teachers. It's a two-way street. It's a mutual responsibility here. Mm -hmm. I know Tammy can talk to a little bit more. Um, Brian has um, much, uh, probably more so than any other district, any of the other districts in any of the tri-county area. He has his um, teachers, I believe, and Tammy, please jump in because you know more about this one than I do, um, holding office hours every single day for maybe three hours a day, but I'm not sure, Tammy, if you can jump. You're on mute, Tammy. Yeah, I'm not sure either what some of the districts are doing. And, and when I get to my report, I can cover some of these questions and things that you have and the things that have been talked about. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, ask a question of Dr. Saylor before we move forward? I guess I would just like to weigh in on the fact that I would really like to see upper elementary kids have access to their Chromebooks. And that's just my personal opinion, if you would consider that with the admin. I concur. 
Okay, thank you. So I, I tend to agree with a lot of what's been said. I have to say, first of all, um, I really thank everyone for this conversation. It, it needs to happen in public so that people can see what we're discussing, the challenges that we face, uh, the timing that uh, it comes into play with, with different options. So uh, given that and, and the discussion that's been had, it sounds like um, for any kind of deliverable, we're looking at uh, coming up with an agreement with Dr. Uh, Etter for a usage agreement for our devices. And if I understood you correctly, Dr. Saylor, you're, you're looking at possible delivery of uh, the first batch of Chromebooks next week. I know that uh, you had uh, mentioned some might be staring at you or cringing at your statement, but I, I will say that uh, if there's actually a need for volunteers to figure out how to get that, uh, those Chromebooks out, I think uh, let us know. And uh, I'm sure there are people who would be willing to help in any capacity needed to make that happen. So if that helps put any of your staff at ease or helps the process along, uh, certainly interested in doing that. I know me personally, uh, I'm very much in favor of the review and enrichment uh, model that was offered by the state because uh, with three children, one in special needs and one in the gifted program and only two parents, there's no way that we could be running the household, working from home and be teachers uh, for three children at the same time. It just won't happen. Uh, but I think that uh, the model that has been selected really gives the opportunity for those interested to uh, grow beyond the menu boards and have other options. So I'm glad to hear that we're exploring what that might look like and uh, uh, what resources might be needed that you can bring back to the board for approval if necessary to make any of that happen. So uh, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll move on to- um, John. Oh, yes. Uh, can I just uh, throw something out with the Chromebooks? Sure. Uh, is it accurate from the board to say we appreciate uh, that uh, there's a potential, it looks like we're going to get Chromebooks out at the middle school level, uh, the board would be supportive of whatever efforts the district could make to look at expanding it beyond that, and that any initiatives that people would look into or ways that they could find to try to get more of the Chromebooks out, particularly at the elementary level, is that what we're saying? Um, is that an accurate statement? What we're saying, what we're saying, Jeff, is that there's some things that we need to bring forward to the board for approval first before we would go to the elementary level because it involves additional financial obligations. Hey, and I don't, I know high school students have the ability to um, have those Chromebooks out, but I know there are maybe a number of students that, for whatever reason, did not sign those out um, at the beginning of the year of the permissions and whatnot, or other students that may have left Chromebooks behind. So I don't want them to get lost either. My understanding from you was um, earlier was that those individuals' parents should contact the building administration to make arrangements to get items like that that might be needed, instrument or Chromebook or something like that. Perhaps there could be arrangements that would be made on a case-by-case -case basis for high students at the high school. Correct, because the students cannot come into the high school, so would be what, what um, the principals would be able to access. That's why it would be a case-by-case -case basis, and the parents would need to contact their, their child's principal. Yeah, Do we have a like plan? Oh, sorry, I was, Julie. I was going to say, it looked like Penn Valley had an interesting program in terms of like a drive-by curbside pickup that they did last week, and that may be a model um, for picking up um, items and things like that if, if that's uh, a possibility. Well, yeah, we, that's we, talk, we, we, we talked about that, Julie, and what we have right now is we have a situation with the closure and actually Brian shared with me that the state police made themselves very visible um, during that process and they were not happy with it whatsoever. We don't want to put um, families in jeopardy by telling families that they have to come out and do this. Um, what, West, what West Branch did is they did and um, I believe Clearfield did and I think maybe Kerwinsville and maybe PO did, is they ran the bus routes or the um, van services to get these out. That way families didn't have to come out because we've also gotten information from families, which you guys probably don't get, I'm sure you guys don't get the emails that we get. You get the, the negative ones, we get the thank you ones. Um, but we've gotten ones from families 
where, where they've said, you know, hey, I just had a brand new baby and I can't come out at all. I can't come out and get this whatsoever. I can't do this. Or I've got four kids at home and I cannot load them in my car to go do this. Or we're a family where we have one car and my husband is still working. He's in healthcare and I don't have a car fare or, or vice versa. We get a ton of those emails. So that's why we're looking at the other way. We're not going to inconvenience our families for this. We're going to figure out how we can get it to them without inconveniencing them or putting them in jeopardy of coming out into the public. Okay, thanks. Yes, and again, uh, thank you to uh, everyone who's been involved in trying to, to uh, figure really figure out a path forward and not knowing how long any of this is going to last, but uh, planning for the unknown, so to speak. So uh, thank you to everybody in the background for uh, the endless hours you're putting into trying to figure out how to make this work. And again, if there's a need for volunteers, please pass that along and I will, uh, I'll do my best to, to find all the help we can get. So with that, let's move on then to uh, Mrs. Burnerford, who can hopefully uh, shed some more light on this subject. So as I usually do, I've divided my um, report into the three areas that are, are pretty much my expertise, the curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, so let's talk about the curriculum a little bit first till I, before I get into the instruction. But um, today I met with the other half of the Fitzgerald family um, we did a Zoom meeting to try to get social studies curriculum started. Um, I will tell you, having facilitated other curriculum writing, it's difficult when you're not all in the same room, um, but it can be done. It can be done. So we got the secondary social studies teachers together today, 6 through 12. Uh, we went into breakout rooms in the Zoom. Uh, we've gotten steps forward for them to start writing the curriculum, which would have been written in the this coming school year with implementation the following school year. Um, but they're eager and excited to get started. Um, they think it's a great use of their time so that they won't be out of their classrooms as much next year. Um, and we talked a little bit what it looks like through the summer and if we don't come back and all those kinds of things. Uh, they did touch upon this idea of instruction and you know, teachers are problem solvers and they're already talking about September. A lot of September was review anyway, when we have a normal school year. So they've talked about how they that we can work together to modify the curriculum. Um, so when we come back in September that our kids are, are ready to go. Uh, in terms of music curriculum, we already started this. I have a Zoom schedule with them tomorrow. They are, I think, in a good place, but we were supposed to meet on March, I believe it was 17th or so, and we didn't get a chance to meet. So uh, we're a little bit behind now with them. Uh, I don't know where our conversation is going to go tomorrow. We may have to extend it to next year to finish up that uh, music curriculum. Music curriculum is very vast in that you've got all the kinds of music from general music to instrumental music to stringed instruments and so um, and a lot of electives. So it's taken us a while to write that curriculum, but we're moving forward on writing that curriculum as well. We should also be starting the science curriculum, but the state is changing the science standards. So we, I've, we've backed off on the science for right now. That doesn't mean that we might not jump back in depending on when we go back in and things or, um, but I don't know that PDE is working on those new science standards at this point either. So um, we're trying to use this, this time um, effectively and efficiently for our teachers. And um, they really embraced the process today. I mean, it was, it was great. It was actually, I told them, you know, they all miss their students. I kind of miss all their faces whenever I, you know, got to see them today. Okay, in terms of instruction, so Dr. Saylor uh, shared that, and I want to step back and say that, you know, <laughs> we were kind of all thrown into this with no answers and no one not knowing when we were coming back. And first we were out a week, and then it was April 6th. And so it's, it's hard for us to try to build something, this continuity, when we don't know how long this continuity is going to go. And in some ways, I mean, I'll be quite honest, we're building the plane as we fly. And our teachers and our principals and our coaches have had endless, endless conversations about what can we do and how can we do best for all students? Because honestly, we have parents out there who want worksheets and they want to advance the curriculum and they want to do those things and they have the means to do those things, technology or not. And we have parents who are trying to find their next meal. And it's really hard to try to find a balance that can meet everybody's needs. So I don't want anybody to think that this that we don't put a great deal of thought into these activities and a great deal of, of planning and, and how it can best work. I meet regularly with the coaches. I met with them yesterday. And, um, and that's one of some of the things I want to talk about. They know too, and I know that these um, menus 
are uh, going to lose their luster. Uh, and that some people lost them right away, <laughs> they lost their luster. So we've been talking and brainstorming ways that could, could help those out. Now, when you talk about us and compare us to other districts, they're doing continuity of education plans much like ours, but how they do that enrichment and review may look differently. And that's, I think, where when you hear, well, okay, so State College is doing this and Baldy Girls is doing this, they're all doing enrichment and review. They're just delivering it in a different way. So as we try to move through these menu boards, we want to try to deliver in a different way as well. We want to partner with our parents more. We want to communicate with our parents more. Um, I think because we were, like I said, flying blindly, we put out there the best work that we could that first week. Then we got into the second week. And again, we tried to build on that and 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 we're doing the best we can. I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't have any quick and easy answers, but I can tell you some of the things that they're talking about for future. Um, they've talked about building a specific extension piece into those menu boards. So there would be all of the activities and then the extension. So for example, and my examples are horrible by the way, but they could be talking about, you know, um, ancient Rome and they could, um, we could actually almost send out links to their Google classrooms that would have a, a piece of literature that they read or something about that. And then they respond and write to that. Um, at the elementary level, we this week included more sight words. We have the sight words for parents. So we're trying to build extension activities each week. We'll start. And we're also trying to expand what they're doing. So, um, you know, we I heard from parents that said that what we were doing was too easy for their kids. Um, one of the things we didn't communicate well enough, and I think somebody else said this, was there's no reason why you, those activities are so broad they're not grade specific. Just because your child is in third grade doesn't mean you have to do only the third grade activities. You could easily go to the fourth grade if that is what you wanted to do as a parent. We didn't communicate that well. There's a lot we didn't communicate well. Um, there's a lot of links that, that we did before that whole page and we've never communicated that, hey, if you really want a lot of extra stuff to do, there's still those links, the Khan Academy and, and um, all those other resources that we offered. Um, we talked about doing some type of cross-curricular projects, adding a project that the kids could, if we wanted to have them submit for feedback. Um, it would not be anything that could be required and it can't be technology-based. So that feedback may be you know, having just some type of conversation on the phone a, a teacher could or um, holding those Zoom meetings or holding Google Classroom Hangout meetings. Um, so those things are expanding as we go. Um, we talked about doing a little more project, maybe one week, the menu board is completely thematic. So, you know, we pick uh, our fourth grade teachers pick um, the ocean. And so all of the activities on the board for each of the four subject areas have to do with the ocean. Um, they're looking at all different kinds of ways to be more engaging with the kids. And they're also at the same time, we need to communicate better with parents on how um, they could access it. what I hear in other districts that are happening that are doing exact same menu boards, by the way, um, we've been copied and I'm sorry that I didn't sell them to some districts because I think I could have made us some extra money for Ken. Um, but what they're doing with those deliveries of those menus looks differently. We can we can start we, we can do better. Um, you know, teachers are kind of I say principals are, are problem solvers and they are and they want to solve the problems. Um, our teachers are very um, eager to do better every week. And I know Dawn and some of these other teachers can tell you that you always want to do better. You do that lesson and you want to do it better. And so that's what their mindset is. We want to do this better. Um, keeping in mind that we also have this social emotional component of these kids that, you know, you really have to worry. I can tell you that our teachers, um, the day, and I talked to several of them, the day that uh, the governor said that we were closed indefinitely, literally cry tears because they are worried for their kids. They miss their kids. Um, their lives have been turned upside down. And that's what's hard in all of this too. Everybody's life has been turned upside down. And so trying to, to put it all together into a, a plan and be mindful of every possible thing that we can is a work in progress. And, I, and again, I think one of the things we haven't done well enough is to communicate what those ideas are with parents, how they could uh, enrich their own kids, where they could go with things. And, and Donna mentioned, you know, if they want to take the curriculum farther, yes, could we mention that to parents? Say, hey, uh, you know, we, you might want to, if you want to read the novel, I don't know what they do in seventh grade, but if they want to read the novel, um, you know, that they could do that. Or they, 
you know, some kids were in the middle of novels too, from what I've heard. But um, so there are lots and lots and lots of things we can do out there to make it better. Um, and we strive to make it better every week. I met with the coaches yesterday and they were, they're just chomping at the bit. You know, they're just um, trying to get um, all of the um, ideas that they can. And they can, again, it's this building, it's this building and trying to do um, the best we can. And the other problem that we have is this equity piece as far as um, those boards have to be accessible to all kids. And that means all kids levels. And anybody who's a teacher can tell you that that's the most, one of the most dis difficult things in a regular classroom. As you've got kids on both ends of the spectrum where you're trying to meet their individual needs. Now we're trying to meet those individual needs remotely, which makes it even more difficult. Um, so we're trying to meet kids needs more difficult. And we've got parents who have needs that, that vary a great deal because they are, they, some of them are incredibly overwhelmed and some of them are just give us more, we, we need more. And so the balance is very, very difficult. But I want you to know that there's a lot, a lot of discussion going on about how we can do what we're doing better um, in, in the confines of, of our continuity of education plan and in the confines of equity. Uh, I'll talk about assessment and then we can go, um, <clears throat> we can talk more. So the assessment piece that I threw in was we didn't give PSSAs or keystones, which honestly, I will say this publicly, I was really glad about that. Um, and there's some pieces that have to be ironed out, but I was also depending a little bit on that data as we build the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan right now is on hold. I think somebody asked that, I think Mr. Cole asked that at the last meeting. Um, we're on hold right now with that. Uh, it would be my hope that the state would give us a, an extension, but you know we don't know. But one of the things we don't have an extension for is we need to build our high school um, targeted and improve support and improvement plan. If you recall, our special ed population um, didn't meet the, the growth areas or the achievement areas for the keystones at the high school level. And so we need to write a separate plan for them. We had just started that when this whole um, coronavirus shut us down. Um, we're going to have to go back and look at that. And we can, in both cases, use the, the 2019 data. I mean, that's not going to be a problem at all. Um, so the canceling of the PSSAs and Keystones is not going to hurt our future work in either one of those areas. Um, I tried to cover everything. That being said, so what are your questions for me? As a teacher, Tammy, I always understood that our curriculum was online somewhere. It is. It absolutely is. And that's a good point, Donna. Uh, um, and we can say that publicly, too. So if you go to the district website where it says our district, anybody, and click down through, you will see, um, I think Rick's going to do that. You will see um, curriculum, and then you can go to the curriculum page, and then you can see all of the curriculum as is. Um, and I believe all of that's updated. Social studies, again, is one of those ones that's in flux right now, and music's in flux. But um, if you go down, Rick, go down to curriculum, you click on curriculum. Um, and any of the, pick one on the side there, Rick, pick, uh, pick, pick uh, yeah, pick business, for example. Um, if you click down through them, you will see what the business curriculum is for each of the business courses. AP, as Dr. Saylor mentioned, we're going to be doing some things differently with AP and college and the high school classrooms. Um, all of our curriculum of what we would have taught in those grade levels is there. That's, business isn't a great example. Go to, um, go to um, ELA, Rick. It'll say uh, English language arts at the top. Click there. So you can see... Um, if you scroll down, you can see, um, for, for example, what the um, pick sixth grade reading informational text curriculum looks like. Uh, if you click there, it will tell you the big ideas that are taught in that sixth grade year. Um, it, it, it is exactly what where we will pick up next year whenever we have to fill in those places. Um, talks about the standards, it'll tell you exactly what's done. Um, so those things are out there and perhaps, you know, Don, I think that's probably a good idea. Maybe that's somewhere we need to point parents who are trying to just figure out, you know, what else is out there kind of thing. Um, I think that would work. Do you, Donna? I do. And also reminder of if they have an online textbook, what the link is, what the passwords were. Yeah, that that's a really good idea. Help. That's a great idea. Um, 
And I'm um, assuming and we're we, talking about putting that in the on the board for a particular class that's applicable to that information. That's correct. And just a, a short note about the boards. We were trying to stick to one page so it wasn't so overwhelming. We decided just yesterday there is no way we can stick to one page. So one of the discussions were that we had the basic menu board on the front and then those extension and enrichment um, ideas on the back of those. And then uh, the, we would print the specials one separately. So we're going to have to go to a two page format, but we can certainly that's a, a great idea. We can put their uh, remind them of their text links and things. Uh, another thing that I don't I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but I think we need to align a little bit with what our teachers are doing and what our parents and students are seeing for those kids that do have that access so that we've set these office hours at the secondary level. But um, I don't know that we've communicated well enough that kids could reach out to the teachers and ask for feedback during that time or ask for clarification or say, hey, I forget how to find the slope of a line. Um, we have not communicated that well enough. And so um, I think what we need to do is say that that's a, a resource that, that is available for our teachers and parents as well. Other questions? Any ideas? You know, the other thing that I think we need to communicate better is that I know parents are frustrated, but uh, I think we've got to build those relationships to work in more of a partnership in a better way. Uh, it, we need to be mindful. I think I s saw somewhere on Facebook, you know, we have parents that, that want all of that kind of information and we have parents that, you know, are just trying to survive. And so whatever we can do to help. I can tell you that there's a, a situation at Belfont Elementary this week where a parent was going to be evicted which thank goodness the eviction law was passed and she wasn't. She has three very small children at Belfont Elementary and our principals and teachers and social worker and counselor were trying to find ways to help her that way too. So our, our teachers are reaching out to help families in whatever way they can. Um, I don't know, we've got to make teachers, we've got, we've got to align that a little bit better in my opinion so that they know that, that who's there and where, when they're there and that kind of thing. Um, well, as you say, thought. As you say, uh, there's always room for improvement. And uh, I, I think things are, given the situation, things are unfolding uh, relatively quickly and amazingly well. It's just a matter of really communicating what's available and, and what's been done. So I, again, I, I've said it several times, I really appreciate the conversation that's happening here tonight. Um, if for no, it may seem redundant to uh, employees of the district, but to the community and board uh, maybe not so much. So hopefully it's clearing up a lot of questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Burnerford. Thank you. And but and, and one more thing, if you have any questions or anything that I can do, or you know of a parent out there that are the principals or I can help, just let us know. I mean, we we our teachers are phenomenal and they're doing a phenomenal job in reaching out to families. Um, so yeah, if there's anything I can do to help, please let me know. I'm more than willing and happy to help. Thank, Thank you, you, Tammy. Thank you, Dr. Saylor. I do have to say, I am also a parent. I have a daughter um, in school and I, I'm i not going to specifically say what school or teachers, but her teachers have been doing a terrific job reaching out, Zoom meetings, things like that. So um, it is so nice to hear, uh, Tammy, what you've contributed and what the teachers are doing. So it's great to to hear that there's a plan to keep moving forward. So thank you. Okay, with that, uh, is Mrs. Carroll or Mr. Clark with us this evening? Anyone from the Education Support uh, Association? Okay, with that, we'll move into the uh, consent agenda then. And it uh, looks like items 601 through 604 uh, entertain a motion uh, for that as a consent agenda. Uh, Krell, so moved. Bruckner, second. Okay, uh, then we'll go right to roll call, please. Mr. Kazar? Yes. Mr. Kroll? Yes. Mr. Musser? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Steiner? Yes. Ms. Weaver? Yes. Dr. Badger? Yes. Mrs. Bruckner? Yes. Mrs. Fitzgerald? Yes. 
Okay, motion carries, thank you. Brings us down to item 701. And I apologize, this is lengthy, so hopefully uh, the internet feed will be suitable. So it is recommended that the board approve pursuant to Act 13 to authorize the administration to renegotiate the contracts for school bus transportation services to ensure that contracted personnel and fixed costs, including administration and equipment, are maintained by the transportation contractors during the period of school closure. Such renegotiated contracts shall require school bus transportation contractors to submit weekly documentation that their complement levels remain at or above the level that existed on March 13th of 2020 in order for them to continue to be paid. And it shall have provisions that if the contractors receive payments from the federal government or other sources for all or some of these costs that amounts be paid that amounts paid by the district that are attributable to some or all of the costs be remitted back to the district in a lump sum payment or periodically from payments that would be due from transportation services provided in the 2020 2021 school year. So for information it's provided that the district continues to pay its contractors in this manner the district shall remain eligible for reimbursement from the Department of Education at a rate the district would have received had the pandemic of 2020 not occurred. Do I have a motion for that? Steiner, so moved. I just second. second. Uh, if, if I could just say, uh, I was attached on some of the go between emails with Mr. Gazar, Mr. Bean and Mr. Adders. Uh, this is just another example of one of these uh, situations where there's a lot of thought and time and energy just to get something that normally is routine activity for the district. Um, the dynamics and, and making sure that uh, doing the right thing generally and also for the people, the district acts as a pass through uh, for employees of different agencies and, and organizations that do services for the district. So I just want to thank uh, Ken and Scott and John um, for the behind the scenes work that they do did in this case uh, with this situation and in so many others that were probably not even being uh, made aware of tonight. Thanks, Jeff. Any other comments on this one? I uh, had a question and uh, Scott, you might be able to help me with this. So. Um, how would we know, for example, if a contractor, um, let's say, received money through the payroll protection program, uh, what would that, I guess I'm a little confused at how we would really know for sure, other than the honor system, what companies received from other sources that we would be due money back? We would have that written in our uh, renegotiated agreement with them that they would periodically, as part of their weekly submissions to us, make us aware of that type of thing. Could we uh, also, would it be reasonable for us to also include a statement that any funds that are available that we require them to apply for those funds? For example, well, the payroll protection? I, I had a email communication in another district earlier today. That particular one may be somewhat problematic because if they're, they're required to use the payroll protection program funds in part, or there's the strong incentive for them to use it for payroll. So if they're getting payroll from us and payroll from them, they, pen, they essentially are gonna to have to repay that because it's not gonna be forgiven. So it will, it will work only as a loan. So I'm guessing that most of them will, have, will not have an interest in applying for that particular program, but maybe they will, I'm not sure. Yeah. I well, I'd really like to encourage you if there's some way that they can participate in, in that program. I think even if they're denied uh, forgiveness, it's only a 1% loan, it turns out to be. But uh, I guess I would, I would really like to see, and I don't know if it has to be used for payroll during a certain period, or you just have to show that it was used for payroll, because uh, I think two things, uh, another board member had mentioned that uh, in order for them to to be in favor of this, we need to make sure that there are protections that we can ensure that the money we give is actually going for payroll or that, let me rephrase that. 
we want to make sure that their drivers are still getting paid. That's the whole intent. That's uh, that's part of the weekly certification that they'll be required to give to us. Okay. And well, Ken, I, Ken can certainly speak to this issue better than I can, but we're talking about a comparatively smaller portion of the school year, maybe one third of the school year, and the amount potentially that we would be paying for personnel costs for the tra uh, contractors, transportation contractors, may offset entirely, I'm not sure, as I said, Ken will, can speak to it, maybe not tonight, the amount of reimbursement that you're going to get from the Department of Education for transportation for the entire year. So there's a strong incentive for you to continue as a district, assuming that your reimbursement levels are at a certain threshold uh, to continue to pay in this manner. Yeah, we we get about six hundred to six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year for our transportation reimbursement. We only have uh, April, May, and June. We we pay through June, uh, spread out evenly. So it, it's going to be very close if it isn't under that anyway. Yeah, that's fine. I guess I just in the back of my mind, I have this nagging feeling like we're disincentivizing the the need to seek out other avenues so that the district wouldn't have to do that. But but also understand the part that you're talking about is we certainly don't want to jeopardize uh, the revenue stream that we would get uh, by not doing so. So uh, thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? OK, with that, then we'll move to a roll call, please. Mr. Crow? Yes. Mr. Musser? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Steiner? Yes. Mrs. Weaver? Yes. Dr. Badger? Yes. Mrs. Bruckner? Yes. Mrs. Fitzgerald? Yes. Mr. Gazar? Yes. That motion carries. Thank you. Uh, do we have any items for a future discussion that we'd like to bring up this evening? I have two. One is uh, regarding the construction committee. I'm, I'm assuming some of your, some of John's uh, discussion during uh, the board president report probably talked a little bit about the construction committee, but I would like to have an actual report, perhaps at the next meeting, that would encompass the proposed meetings that are, that are being scheduled by Hunt and others. Uh, whether the public can attend either virtually or in the future physically. Uh, the charge of the committee, since this is a board committee, and it's a board committee because John is the chair. And uh, if there are any minutes, minutes being taken, I would like to have them attached at the next meeting. And when we could possibly see a report from Hunt. Then the second piece is I would like to have an update on international travels for our students. Okay, um, so as far as international travel goes, uh, Dr. Saylor, is that something you can coordinate or have uh, someone give us a report on that? Absolutely, we've had discussions on that. Um, we have our timelines that we have to meet. You know, um, we were waiting to the last minute to pull the rug on some of these things. Um, there's voucher options, there's additional pieces that we can look at. And um, Mrs. Krish is very familiar with that. She's been working um, with um, EF tours and trying to consolidate this information for our family. So we can definitely do that. Okay, thank you. And Rod, I, I did uh, talk briefly about it, but uh, uh, as you notice on the board docs, I did not have anything in writing this evening. So I uh, expect that full report then at the next meeting. That's no problem. Anything else we'd like to have for a future discussion? I was just uh, saying, yeah. John, can you, sorry. No, oh, that's okay. Do you okay. want to go ahead and I'll... Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I know um, I had asked about it earlier, um, about uh, some ways to measure the number of um, folks that are accessing the choice menus and or the... Um, 
uh, paper menus, if they're uh, educational menus, if, if we can kind of have a report of that just to understand um, the usage a little bit better and the usage over time. Um, okay. So uh, I think that it sounds like that's part of an ongoing thing, but if there's uh, any information that we can continue to have that discussion uh, in the future, we'll look at that. Any others? Uh, yeah, I just had one. Um, if we can uh, look into what it would take to be able to put uh, students' lockers contents in, uh, to be able to get those out, what it, basically what it would take to, to get that done. Okay, I don't know, uh, Dr. Saylor, is there, so let's say we go through uh, June and we've addressed all the individual concerns of people that had a need and reached out um, to address that need. What would be, have we thought about or uh, uh, planned for a cleaning out of the lockers prior to getting through the summer? Yeah, we talked about that as an administrative team and we talked about what other districts were considering um, some districts are basically um, taking the locker contents from each locker and putting it in individual um, trash bags, for lack of a better word, labeling them. And then, then also, um, if we're still under uh, shelter in place, delivering them via bus runs. And if we're open to where, you know, we can't go back to school, we can't have large gatherings, but we might be able to um, at least leave our homes, um, you know, scheduling those um, pickups. For, for kids for that. So we have talked about that and how we can do it. I will tell you that um, some administrators have been very cautious about it, you know, and they ask questions about, you know, well, how are we going to, if a, if a kid says he has, and this is, I'm just sharing this, you know, if a kid says he has something in his locker and we go in and clean his locker out and it's not in his locker, is the school going to be liable for it? Are we going to be held responsible? Are we going to be accused of stealing something? <laughs> You know, um, so we've had those conversations, you know, and we know ultimately, you know, come the end of the year, we have to get that stuff back to the kids one way or the other. So, yes, ab absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other items for future discussion? All right, with that, then we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Steiner, yes. Oh, <clears throat> Bruckner second. Okay, and uh, unfortunately, because it's electronic, we need to do roll call on all voting. So roll call. Mr. Musser? Aye. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Steiner? Yes. Mrs. Weaver? Yes. Dr. Badger? Yes. Mrs. Bruckner? Yes. Mrs. Fitzgerald? Yes. Mr. Gazar? Yes. Mr. Crow? Yes. Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much for participating and for all those viewing. Uh, greatly appreciated. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Cheers. Good night, Have a good everyone. One. Have a good night.